Hey, everybody. I think some of you are still maybe getting your audio. Um, just going to give it a second here to make sure everybody can hear me. And I wanted to let you all know that um, uh, we are recording this session today. Um, so you may have seen that as you entered, that we're recording at least part of the session. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Rachel Bauer. I'm the PI for AT Central, um, uh, which acts as an information hub for the AT community and also Access ATE, which helps provide community members with information about accessibility and how to make materials um, more usable by a, by a wider group of folks. Um, we are thrilled to be working with Ellen Haas today um, from AACC, um, who, who really is the person who, of course, runs the uh, ATPI conference, along with her team, her valuable team of, of um, uh those uh, other folks like Courtney and um, others you may know from the American Association of Community Colleges. Ellen, do you want to just say hi really quick before we dive in? Sure. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Mike, uh, for offering this. And thanks to all of you for, for being a part of this session. This is the first time we have offered this at the ATE conference. And we're uh, very excited to share this information with you. And thank you for your uh, commitment in, in presenting to the conference and uh, making it as accessible as possible for our attendees. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. And I'm on in chat. If there are any general questions throughout, feel free to throw them my way too. Awesome. So, you know, this is a very, this is going to be a very informal session for the most part. Uh, Mike is going to have a presentation <clears throat> with slides that he's going to go through, um, which is going to be recorded. And then we're going to stop the recording um, and then we'll just get into general discussion um, and get your questions answered. And there there are no wrong questions. You know, like, feel free to ask anything. Um, I've worked with Mike for years. He's extremely knowledgeable. I'm going to let Mike introduce himself. Feel free to pop questions into chat or raise your hand. We're a nice smallish group today, so we can certainly just have discussions. And uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. Mike, do you want to introduce yourself and kick things off? Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Mike Sauter, and I'm an alternate media and assistive technology specialist. And I work at uh, Saddleback College in Southern California, down in Orange County. And I've, I've been in the field of accessibility and assistive technology for going on 24 years now. Um, and uh, it's um, quite a wonderful gig now. I think maybe we can call it a career at this point. But um, so I, I do, I work with students um, with uh, accessibility issues um, and accommodations. And so um, <clears throat> my expertise comes with working with students and trying to find solutions for them using some kind of technology. Um, and web accessibility and presentation accessibility is well within that wheelhouse. So um, hopefully today um, we'll be able to uh, talk about some accessibility um, situations during a presentation and um, recognizing that I'm sure a lot of you are um, uh, instructional faculty and are used to being in front of groups, but not everybody. Uh, so um, maybe we can give you some good tips or some things to to think about um, as you are presenting at the conference. So um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So uh, let's uh, dive in. To I uh, do have a presentation prepared. Uh, <clears throat> Let's go ahead and, and uh, <clears throat> jump into that. Hopefully, um, you all can see the presentation. Anything? I'm with just it? seeing presentation notes. I'm not actually seeing a slide for some reason. Up oh, there we go. Oh. And by the way, it, I've I just want to say this because it happened to us in our last Zoom call. They've changed yeah. something in Zoom now, where. If, if you, when Mike shares the screen, if you're not seeing anything, if you're just seeing our faces, you have to go up to the top and pick Mike Sauter's screen. It'll show you at the top of Zoom two different things. Um, Mike, I'm not seeing anything, but I'm also, I don't think you're sharing. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So you should see meeting. And if you click on meeting, you just see our faces. And if you click on Mike Sauter's screen, you should see his presentation. So hopefully... <clears throat> Let's see if we can get this. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. You're right. I mean, they have just changed a lot with 
Yeah, it's not, you're not getting, so let's try a different way. You might be able to do it by view or something. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Oh, technology, such fun. I know, right? Let's well, try. it does make me feel slightly better that Mike occasionally has problems because he's this. way more technically savvy than I am. Anything? No, I'm still, are you guys still getting presenter notes slide one? Yeah. Yeah, it keeps defaulting to my other screen. So let me just. Oh, I see. Yeah, I've got too many screens going on. That's what's happening. <clears throat> That's what's happening. Too got much it. happening. Let's try this. Yay. Oh, kidding. Yeah, we're good. Rock and roll. You seen the big picture? Yes, we are. <laughs> we're good. Now I can't see any of my notes, so I guess we're we're even. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this this is being brought to you uh, by Access ATE uh, to um, help you with your presentations um, at the PI conference. So um Let's just uh, jump into this. Um, I'm just going to go through the slides and talk to you about uh, uh, some of the things uh, so for you to consider for your presentation. And uh, after, like uh, Rachel said, we'll have some questions and be able to talk about um, any specifics that you have with, with your presentations. Um, but just some general ideas around presenting. Um, the first thing is just obviously be organized. <clears throat> Make sure that you have uh, outlined your thoughts and organized your content so that it follows a really good natural flow and um, understanding what your goals are, what your learning objectives are. And I don't know about you, but often when I put in a presentation at a conference, it's, you know, six months in advance. Um, I may have completely forgotten what I wrote as my uh, presentation description or even my you know, uh, outcomes. And so it's, for me, I always go back to that. And because I want to make sure that I'm hitting the mark of the presentation, like what are people actually coming and expecting? So make sure I'm, I'm answering the questions that I, I intended to answer. Um, and um, <clears throat> so it just, it, it just something that I've experienced in my own life, right? Um, understand who your audience is. Who am I presenting to? Am I presenting to industry professionals? that understand the information that are presenting to them at a much higher level than someone who is just coming in for information, right? And, and uh, so is it more of an informational presentation type, um, presenting on your project or your program, right? Um, to people that are um, just coming in without really knowing or having any background. So if that's the case, like, Make sure that your language you're using isn't industry specific language or jargon like um, acronyms or things like that, that they may not understand. You know, understand your time, understand how much time you have um, so that you can set up your presentation to leave enough time at the end for questions if that's what you need. Um, and then I always try to think about some of the questions that could be asked during the presentation so that I um, have at least prepared myself, maybe put some resources together too, to anticipate what probably uh, may come from the audience. Um, that one, it makes you sound really smart at the end too, that you can handle just about any situation. But um, also it, it does help me kind of reflect on, am I giving them enough information during the pre presentation so that maybe there's no questions at the end, which I don't know, crickets at the end of a presentation could be good or bad, right? Okay, so as we're putting all this together, think about inclusivity, including everyone in that room, ensuring that all of the slides and the media that you have, um, the handouts are accessible. And, and understanding that in the audience, you may have people with hidden disabilities that are not you know, uh, I mean, obviously a, a deaf individual is going to have uh, probably uh, ASL sign uh, language interpreter up in the front. So it's, that's pretty obvious, but you may have people that can't see well or hear well, maybe have mobility issues or not able to verbalize questions, right? Or even understand like cognitively, they may be dealing with um, different types of issues as well. Um, working with students um, from all different um, 
backgrounds and experiences has taught me that you cannot guess what someone is going through in that classroom. Um, and especially when it's a hidden disability, um, if you are planning for that, then your presentation will come off and uh, for everyone in the room, which is uh, such a wonderful place to be. Okay, so getting to the actual visual aids, um, the um, actual PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides or whatever you are choosing to create your presentation, I always go to the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, silly, right? <laughs> We're in a professional environment. But just the simplicity of the presentation, I think, is really important. Um, choosing the right background and template so that my information is front and center and it's not being covered or it's not too busy. And, and um, for someone who is uh, very highly distractible, having elements on the screen that can take away from the actual text, right? Um, the background that I'm using for this presentation, I'm using Keynote, and I don't know if you can tell, but there is mo movement in the background. There's a small little movement, right? And um, I love it. I think it's very dynamic, but it also can take away from the presentation. Um, I've slowed it down a lot so that it's not very noticeable, but it is there. It is there. Um, but it's a balance, right? <clears throat> so um, your templates um, should be nice and, and clean and clear. Uh, colors are great, right? But avoid using them for meaning. Avoid having text that's red and bolded and the intention is for that to mean something. Uh, someone who is coming in colorblind may not get that, right? They may not uh, understand that. Um, <clears throat> so that com comes into the tables, charts, and graphs, and all that information that you're being displayed. Now, it, it's not, I'm not saying that you have to read everything on the screen to, um, to the audience, right? But when you're using tables and charts and graphs that are displaying information, you should be prepared to talk about that data and talk about the relationships between the data so that someone who is visually impaired can still grasp the idea of what you're trying to show them, right? Um, is, it a, is it a pie chart, right? Is it a pie chart? So it literally saying, here's a pie chart showing the relationship between the respondents saying yes, no, and maybe. And there were 75% yes, 10% maybe, and then the rest were maybe, I'm not doing math in my head, sorry. Um, but like, you get the idea, like be prepared to, to speak to that data and describe what it is being displayed at, right? Um, some, of these, some of the programs that you may be presenting on will be highly technical and you may have a lot of data. So if that's the, the situation um, and, and you wanna go through the, a lot of data, just be prepared to, uh, to talk as best as you can through that information and then maybe provide that data is um, as handouts or takeaways um, for the uh, resources for people to use so that they can dive into it in a, in a, in a more accessible way, right? On the screen, fonts need to be clear, well-spaced and um, highly contrasted against the background. All right, so choose your fonts wisely. And then if you're using graphics, um, graphics are wonderful. Uh, they, you know, provide a light uh, a take on a subject, maybe a little whimsical. Um, if you're using graphics just for placement or for pleasure, that's absolutely fine, right? Just uh, maybe talk about it. Like, hey, there's a graphic on the screen that shows a, you know, White House in the background of a large field. And it actually has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, you know? Or maybe the graphic actually does have some relevant information. Um, just again, be prepared to talk about that. <clears throat> okay. So, so handouts. Is anyone still bringing handouts to the presentation? Right. Absolutely okay to bring handouts. In in my opinion, handouts can be a wonderful resource for people. 
to take with them, right? If you are providing handouts, then I feel you should provide an alternative to that handout, to that physical handout. So, so going digital, right? We've all are now so accustomed to seeing QR codes, right? It's it should be included in just about everything that you are uh, preparing to hand out. Um, so you can have uh, a digital copy of not only your handouts but also your presentation. So imagine the scenario where when people walk in, they're able to scan your QR code and get a copy of your presentation at their seat so that they can follow along with it, right? So if they are visually impaired, they can have it on their personal device and not have to rely on the screen um, across the room, but they can keep it personal. And also they can take it with them. They can have it, um, bring it back to their college where they can talk about the ideas that, uh, that you were sharing about um, your program. Um, I've added here a wonderful resource that I've used for years, QR Code Monkey. <laughs> It uh, creates real quick, easy to use QR codes. Um, and I do have a page of resources that I will provide to you after this as well with uh, links that are clickable, okay? Um, and then as far as the format of those handouts, I prefer them to be in Word or Google Doc for accessibility. If you have someone who is visually impaired who's using a screen reader, a PDF document will give them some trouble if it's not created correctly. And it does take a little bit of work to create a PDF correctly with the right formatting. So if you use Word or Google, you're, you're gonna give them a better experience and they will be able to use their technology to read it out loud for them. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here. I see some questions in the chat. Anything you want me to, to touch on, Rachel? Um, I think there was just one question about um... Uh, what do you think about using bold and italics rather than color for emphasis? It's it's it does fall in the kind of the same category of of color in that if I mean if you are going to use bold or italics to emphasize something, you should probably mention it out loud for anyone for anyone that is um, visually impaired. Yeah, right. But it's probably a better choice for those of us who who. Because because it would be fine for someone who's colorblind, in other words. Yeah, if you're using like a, a you know a, a blue or a green color, someone who um, is colorblind, blue green, will just see it as gray anyway. Right. Right. So they may see a small contrast, but 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 probably not. But bold, but bold, bolding bold, something or bold underlining or telling. Underlining. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Okay, um, getting to the media, uh, videos, graphics, and demos. Um, so if you are using uh, videos, they, they must be captioned. Um, this is not new news here. Um, captioning should be available on any media that you are playing for the audience. Um, now, <clears throat> there are some wonderful tools out there that produce really amazing captions. Um, but if you are stuck with a, a time crunch and you need to produce something usable for your videos before the presentation, YouTube does work. It's gotten a whole lot better of producing automated captioning. It's not perfect, but in a situation where you need something immediately, you can upload your video to YouTube and it will automatically generate captions that you can then display when you play it in the room. A Canvas, if you're using Canvas on your campus, Canvas also has a wonderful captioning creator built right into the program, and that produces really good captions. You know, a lot of times it comes down to trends, like I just need to transcribe the video first, right? So imagine um, trying to transcribe your 12-minute your video quickly, um, that can be a challenge. There are some other tools out there that you can use to transcribe your videos. Um, one of them is otter.ai, which is um, you can get a free copy of Otter and um, upload your video and it'll transcribe it in a matter of seconds. And then you can take that transcription as text 
and then add it into your video using one of those other tools like uh, like canvas um i don't want to dump i don't want to dive too deep into that your campuses should have a faculty center or someone on campus that could help you with providing captions on your videos um, they may not be able to do it for you but they definitely can point you to the resources that you have available okay um just to mention uh, captions are on here on the um uh, for our presentation, all you have to do is just click on the caption button at the bottom of the screen. Probably should have mentioned that before we started, right? Sorry about that. I have, we are not perfect. A, there was a quick question yeah. about um, Adam asked if QR code is the same as if it's the same company as SurveyMonkey, and is it free? Good question. It's not the same thing as SurveyMonkey. It's um, it's a separate website company probably um, but it's just called yeah qr monkey and it is free you can use it for free okay free is good we like free yeah absolutely me too um <clears throat> now uh if you are demoing any software or virtual reality type experiences um this this becomes really important that you are describing what's happening on the screen so if you are opening up a, a piece of software and you are um, walking them through a particular process, it's important that you describe what you're doing and where you're doing it. So if I am on a, uh, let's say I'm in a, a software like Microsoft Word and I say, okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go, uh, you're gonna go here and you're gonna click here and then you're gonna come down to the menu and click on this, right? So you're using words that mean nothing to someone who can't follow along with you visually, right? Instead, use words like click on the file menu, drop down to, in the list, down to format, and then click over on text. And so now that, student, that the person can follow your direction if they needed to, right? Um, describing that you're, you're clicking on an icon, on the top left of the screen that looks like a fish, you know, something that's really descriptive as you're going along with it. Um, I've sat in a room where Amazon was presenting to a predominantly blind audience. And the presenter was literally saying, click here, now click here, now click there. And it was like, I was uncomfortable. I, you know, and finally somebody did say something. Can you please describe what and where you're clicking? Because I can't see it. Um, let alone like I'm using a mouse and people who are blind are not using mice. <clears throat> so same thing goes with like VR uh, type of a demo. Uh, I know a lot of VR um, presentations are happening now too. And I would say too, slow down when you're doing that, because if you're slow used down. to using a particular piece of software, I feel like sometimes people demo so quickly and I'm like, I, I don't even know what just happened. Something flew around and we're someplace else now, you know? So really yeah. going slowly with demos, I think people often just don't slow down enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to touch on contrast right now because this is a big one. Um, color and contrast in your presentations. Um, following the WCAG, which is the uh, website guidance for accessibility, um, they recommend color contrast as a ratio. And uh, their recommendation is a ratio of uh, four to one for graphs and seven to one for text. And what that means is visually, you can see it on the right-hand side of the screen there in that, uh, that chart, some really good examples and bad examples of color contrast. So if you're using a background color, even like on your template or in a shaded box, and you have text in that or over that as well, the contrast between those two colors must be significant, right? You must have really good significant change in color contrast. Um, so, uh, you know, a gray text on a white background, really bad contrast. Um, a, uh, uh, a white text on a yellow background or yellow text on a blue background, really bad color contrast. Not only bad contrast, but also bad color combinations for color blindness as well, right? And that's the reason why we are doing this is because color blindness happens across a lot of different spectrums, right? So um, to avoid having um, that error, 
that issue where literally the text disappears behind in the color, right? You want to avoid some of these combos, right? And if you are actually using really good contrast and, and still color, you will be able to navigate through this, right? And if you didn't notice too, Mike had a link to a tool that you can use to check I was, out. Yeah, and I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna click on that link at the end and we'll show you that tool. Okay, cool. Okay. The way it's the sharing is working right now, I don't want it. Yeah, the tool is really cool. It is. So any questions on the colors, contrast? So, somebody just put in chat, and I thought this was really interesting, that when you're presenting like this, imagine you're telling, you're talking to somebody on the phone rather than in person, because if you were on the phone with them, you'd have to describe everything because they're the, you know, presume if you were on the phone and trying to talk to something, somebody about an idea, you'd have to describe everything. So I like that. Yeah. We do have a quick question from Ken. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. So uh, in my presentation, part of what I'm doing is referring to some elements that can be and of reporting that can be analyzed on a spectrum. Now, all of a sudden, I'm wondering if the idea of even referring to a, a spectrum is maybe not a great idea. Because if somebody's vision impaired, do they have an idea of how a spectrum works or a gradient? You know, I demonstrated with a gradient mm. graphic. I think you could well, describe I, it. Yeah, I think describing it spectrum, I mean, the other word that you used there was gradient, right? So that's a good word to describe a, a spectrum, especially if your um, the data set that you're showing is um, on an incline or declined or somewhere in between, right? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be describing data. I'm going to be describing elements of writing for reporting. So it's like oh. the spectrum of data to narrative, for example. Yeah. So, you know, a report a report element can be data or it can be pure narrative, but it probably lies in between is the idea. Mm. Well, I think that's an okay concept to talk about. And if you have a graphic, you could just say there's a graphic on the screen right now that represents that concept. And that way, you know, if there's if the graphic is there mostly to sort of show people that, I think you're okay to talk about mm -hmm. it. Is, is there a graphic involved or are you just talking about the concept? Nope, graphics involved. Okay. I you got know, it, we thank can you. Do, well, we, and we can also, once we're done with this portion that's recorded, when we come out of this to the portion where we're talking just as a group, if you want to share that, you're welcome to. And Mike, Mike could look at it or even look at it after yeah. the presentation. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, next, live captions can be added to your presentation, even in a conference room or in a classroom. Um, hopefully, you've heard about this. Maybe you've tried it. Um, if you haven't, this is a wonderful feature that's available in Google Slides and in PowerPoint. And what it does is it, it, it literally provides live captions using AI directly on the screen during your presentation. And it's really easy to set up. In Google Slides, you can find the option um, under the um, option menu, click on caption preferences, and then turn on captions. And then captions appear at the bottom of the screen. In PowerPoint, it's found under the slide ribbon for slideshow. And there's a button that says always use subtitles. And then when you go into presentation mode, it will display the captions at the bottom of the screen and also um, crop the image of the slides so that captions are displayed clean and don't overlay on top of the, the PowerPoint. And I can walk you through both of those scenarios after the the presentation for sure. Um, but it is a super wonderful accessibility tool that if you're using PowerPoint or Google Slides in your classroom, you can turn on today and provide captions to your class. Right? And um, you will be surprised at how many people will take advantage of those captions. I mean, 
I have captions on on my TV at home pretty much all the time now. Uh, especially when I'm watching Netflix and I'm watching some kind of period drama, I need to hear, I can't hear everything with the accents. Captions make a huge difference. And I, I'm sure that you have that same experience as well. Uh, but that's now available to you. Um, so wonderful accessibility that um, opens up um, usability for um, more people in the audience. Um, and then uh, finally, I do have some resources to share with you, and I will share these with you um, in a um, Google Doc that I'll uh, load up into the chat so you can download it. Um, but there are wonderful resources available for Microsoft PowerPoint accessibility, Apple uh, Keynote, Google Slides, uh, the color contrast checker, which we will uh, go through. I've got the QR code, monkey link, and then also the uh, link to the Access ATE site, which has a really great uh, resource on presentations as well. Okay. We just had one other question in chat. Um, is there a recommended font size for slide text? Oh, yeah. I mean, as big as you can get it on the screen. <laughs> um, yeah, if you if you, that's a good point, and that's something I didn't mention. But yeah, if you have a lot of text that you that you need to go through, um, just be comfortable of breaking it up. Trying to fit it all on one slide feels like uh, you know a super efficient way to do it. But breaking it up, giving yourself the space to you know, and maybe the permission to have multiple slides on the same topic is okay because um, having bigger font so that everyone in the room can read it. I think is more important than trying to fit it all on one um, on one page, you know. So yeah, give yourself the space that you need. I would say. And then here is my contact information. You can scan that code or just email me, um, and I am available to help um, in any way that I can. Nick, did, what were you, I can't quite tell what you were asking. Especially curious if you know it's an all virtual versus in person. Do you want to either clarify and chat or pop on? Yeah, I have heard before like 20 is like the minimum font size if you're like in a presentation, but a, just a part of me wonders if it can be, if that's like a good guideline, if you know, if it's like a smaller presentation that you know is going to be completely virtual. Um, because if you're in person and, you know, you have to think about distance, but if you know everyone's a certain distance yeah. from the laptop. 20 is pretty, pretty small. Um, and, and if you're in a big room, a big conference room, uh, that's going to be hard to see. The, I've just looked at my slides and most of my text is at 48. Okay. okay. All, like all of the bullet text was at 48. We'll have, um, and somebody asked to have the QR code back so that everybody could capture it, which M Mike will do in a, in a sec. Let's do that. We can do this demo. And yeah, then... I'll add my email in the chat too. Okay. Guys? okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So here is this uh, wonderful tool for contrast checking. Um, this is from WebAIM and it is a really easy to use. You can choose the color that you would like to use for your font. And so let's pick a horrible example like yellow and it yellow on white background and it'll show you the ratio. So we have 1.2 to one, which is really bad. And then it'll also give you examples of what that would look like if you were to use it. Um, and then it does show you that it does fail the accessibility checkers of WCAG AA and AAA. But if I change my contrasting color to a darker blue, now I can see I've got a really good seven to one ratio and I can see examples of how that looks, right? Now, however, I did talk about blue-green colorblindness and a blue-green colorblind user would have a hard time seeing yellow one because yellow has a lot of green in it. So that may be an issue for colorblindness people. So perhaps finding a color more suitable like uh, darker or maybe a lighter version of red, maybe, or orangish, so forth. So this is a wonderful tool. 
easy to use and easy to find the right different um, colors for you, right? So something you can play with. <clears throat> and... Can you put that um, QR code back up just for a second? Yeah. Let me do this. So in the chat, I will drop in uh, my contact information. That may make it easier. All right, that's great. And then for anyone who would like a copy of all these resources, um, you can just grab that Google Doc. And I've got links for all of uh, the web pages that I was showing, as well as the uh, um, Access ATE. All right, so we're, we're going to stop the recording portion now. So goodbye to everybody who jo is joining us for the recording. But I will say this about um, uh, we will provide text where this recording is about how to get in touch with Mike, because obviously you may not.